Over this last little while, we've been embarking on a fantastic journey through the teaching series, The Power of One. The Power of One. We've been looking at different topics such as the power of one baptism, one Lord, one faith, one spirit. We're going to be continuing on this topic tonight with this title, The Power of Arising as One. When God's people rise up and stand as one. We're in a significant moment here as a church. This month of March, we have labeled and named Making It in March. Make it in March. What is Make it in March? Make it in March is a rallying cry for the church here in Glasgow. It's an opportunity for us to step up and stand up together as one. That's what Make It in March is all about. Make It in March is an opportunity for us to pursue the vision that God has placed within our hearts and see it outworked in this city. That's what Make It in March is all about. Make It in March is a moment for us coming together and building as one. That's what Make It in March is all about. What are we doing this month? What is Make It in March all about? What are we, how are we taking those steps? How are we stepping up, standing up, rising up together as one this month? Well, maybe you remember, if you can recall back to last year, I know it seems like such a long time ago. This year is flying by, isn't it? Last October, we kicked off a series called Mission Possible. And we gave an opportunity during that teaching series, to receive an offering. We received an offering, a special offering, one that we've never really received like before here in Glasgow. It wasn't a financial offering, but it was an offering of ourselves. It was a moment where we chose to step up and be counted. Anyone remember that? Yep. It was a moment where we stepped up and said, count me in. We recommitted ourselves afresh to the vision and the pursuit of what God wants to do in this city through this church. That's what it was all about. The moment where we said, count me in. I'm up for it. We committed ourselves afresh. And this month, make it in March, is a moment for us. It's an opportunity for us to take a step in one of those areas of commitment, specifically within the area of our giving. This month in March, we are believing for 100% of those who said, count me in to tithe and to give. That's what we're reaching for. That's what we said we're going to do last October. This is our moment to walk in it. Do you know, it is blessed to do. It is blessed. The blessing doesn't come in the hearing. It comes in the doing. Now, many of us already walk and diligently act in that faithfully and are bringing in our tithes and giving over and above. And you know, I want to offer a very sincere and heartfelt thank you to every single person who is diligent and faithful in their giving. I want to thank you for that because you're resourcing the work of God. And for those of us who do that diligently and faithfully, well, the call, the cry, the requests, the opportunity this month is to increase that amount just for this month, by 25%. And specifically, our opportunity is coming next week, the 31st of March. And so next week, we're going to be giving an opportunity for those who have not yet embarked on this journey of faith with their giving and with their tithes to start. And for those who already do, it's an opportunity to step up, to exercise their faith again, to reach again, and to give over and above. Why is this moment so important? Do you know, faith is a muscle. Faith is a muscle that we should exercise and grow. And sowing financially is one way in which we can exercise that faith muscle in our lives. We should never become stagnant in it. This is a moment for us in March to step up, to arise as one. That's what it's all about. Why have we called it Make It in March? Why have we called it by that title? Well, there has to be a moment where 
when we are willing to step up and commit. There has to be a moment where we are willing to step up and commit to the things we said we're going to do. Now, this isn't a start-stop exercise. This is a get-up-and-go-for-it moment and continue pushing forward. That's what this is all about. When it comes to making a commitment, we need a starting point. That's what March is all about. That's what next week specifically is all about. It's our starting point. We will make it in March. Do you know, you only have one life. We need to make it a life worth living. We only have one life. We need to make it a life worth living. Let's make it in March. The truth is there is nothing else worth living for. Nothing else worth giving our lives for than the kingdom of God and seeing it forcefully advance in this planet. This is a moment for us as God's people to come together, to step up, rise up, and build as one. That is what this moment is all about. So I am excited about next week because I know God is going to do something incredible and supernatural in the moment. Do you know a great example in the Word, a great story, of people coming together and building, rising up as one, can be found in the story of Nehemiah, in the book of Nehemiah. Maybe you've read the book. It's a fantastic story. I love reading the book of Nehemiah. It really is a great story. It's set in the year 455 BC, or 445 BC rather, 445 years before Christ in the province of Persia. And there's this character called Nehemiah. He was the cupbearer to the king. King Artaxerxes. That was a really trusted position, by the way. I mean, Nehemiah was one of the most influential and trusted people in that kingdom in his day. Every day, the king trusted him with his life. And the story of Nehemiah starts and begins when word comes to him regarding the walls of Jerusalem, God's holy city, which were left in ruins had been burnt to the ground and had not yet been rebuilt. And you know, it broke Nehemiah's heart. It broke his heart to hear that God's holy place laid desolate. Now, 70 years had passed since the temple of God, Solomon's temple, one of the most incredible, spectacular sights of this world, 70 years had passed since that had been rebuilt. It had been destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar. You can read about that in the book of Daniel and in other places as well. King Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed the temple of God, burnt it to the ground, ransacked it. But in the book of Ezra, you can read about the story in which it's rebuilt. The people came together under the decree of King Cyrus. King Cyrus resourced the build. God miraculously got involved and supernaturally, the temple was restored. But once the temple had been restored, it, it kind of seems like God's people lost their way a little bit. They, they forgot what it is what they were meant to be doing. It seemed that when, when they lost vision, once, they, once they'd accomplished one thing, they kind of they lost their vision and their hearts grew cold. And as a result, they distanced themselves from God. And that's really what the book of Ezra is all about. It's about bringing the people of God back on track. But in that moment, the result of it was that the people started to disobey God and disobey his law. And they wandered off from his decrees and his governance. They didn't keep the Sabbath day holy any longer. The men in, in that day began to marry foreign women. And you know, I am glad that that law is finished with because I love my wife. <laughs> Who's foreign, by the way? But you know... Even though Nehemiah was distant, where he was situated was a good 150 miles away from the geographical location of the temple. Even though Nehemiah was distant in terms of his geographic, geographical location, he was closer to the things of God than most who were sat right beside the temple. You read that in the book of Nehemiah where he hears that God's people had wandered, lost track, left the walls of this great city in ruin, and it broke Nehemiah's heart. Not that people sat there, but his heart. Do you know, 
A close proximity to the pew does not equate to an intimate relationship with him. There are people up and down this nation who have sat in church buildings their entire lives and yet whose hearts have never ached for the lost. There are people who have joined in with, with many praise gatherings and many moments, but whose hearts have never ached for the lost, who've never given a consideration for that which concerns God. But I thank God that is not us. Amen. That is not us. Our hearts burn to see the lost one and the kingdom of God advance. We are set on fire for that very thing. It's one of our core values that we will try anything and go anywhere to reach the people for Christ. So this word came to Nehemiah. His heart was moved. His heart was moved to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. You know, the king granted him special permission and gave a decree to allow him to do just that. So Nehemiah set out to accomplish this task. That's what the book's all about. The incredible restoration of the walls around God's city. Early on in the story, we come across two characters who were absolutely determined to stop Nehemiah's plans. They were absolutely determined to stop him dead in his tracks. Those two characters were Sambalat and Tobiah. They were utterly determined to stop Nehemiah from doing what he'd set out to accomplish. See, church, when we set out to accomplish that which God has called us to do, you better believe it, there'll be opposition. But greater is he who is in us than he who is in this world. I want to pick up this story and read it with me. I want to pick up this story in Nehemiah chapter 2. We're going to start from verse 10. This is what it says. When Sambalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about it. It was very displeasing to them that someone had come to seek the welfare of the sons of Israel. And so I came to J Jerusalem, this is Nehemiah, and was there three days. And I arose in the night, I and a few men with me. I did not tell anyone what my God was putting into my mind to do for Jerusalem. And there was no animal with me except the animal on which I was riding. Jump down to verse 16. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done, nor had I as yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or the rest who did the work. But then I said to them, you see the bad situation we are in. Church, look out into the world. You see the bad situation it is in. The Jerusalem is desolate and its gates burned by fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that we will not longer be a reproach. I told them how the hand of my God had been favorable to me and also about the king's words which he had spoken to me. And then they said, let us arise and build. Let us arise and build. Say that with me, church. Let us arise and build. And so they put their hands to the good work. But when Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and Gisham, the Arab, heard it, and they mocked us and despised us and said, what is this thing you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? So I answered them and said to them, the God of heaven will give us success. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. You have no portion, right or memorial, in Jerusalem. Let us arise and build. <coughs> The Hebrew word for this word arise is a little word which is kum. And it literally means to get up from an inactive and sleeping state. It means to step up, to become powerful and focused, utterly determined. It means to arise for action. That's what it means. This word is the same word that a sergeant may use speaking to his army, attention. When he calls the army to attention. And last week, we were encouraged to be the one church militant, forcefully advancing in this city and this nation, plundering hell and populating heaven. That is what God has called us to do. 
Church, this is our attention call today. This is our call to arise and to build. This is our rallying cry moment. That is where we are today. That is what Make It in March is all about. Let us arise and build together. Let us arise and build as one. That is what this month is all about. That is what Make It in March is all about. It's about rising and building as one. Do you know, Nehemiah, he wasn't in full-time ministry. Yet he gave his life to pursuing and building the things of God. He saw and seized the opportunity before him. And after just 52 days, despite the opposition, the walls were rebuilt. He, along with everyone who served, accomplished that which they'd set out to do, that which seemed so impossible. They saw it come through. And you know, Nehemiah explains in the story that it was God's favor and his blessing upon him that enabled him to accomplish that which he'd set out to do. Do you know God wants you blessed? Church, God wants you blessed. He wants you blessed so that you can do all that he has called you to do. God wants you blessed. What does it mean to be blessed? I mean, we say it sometimes, don't we? Maybe we finish it at the end of a text or an email, bless you. Somebody sneezes, bless you. You know we, know, we know that God's promised us his blessings. The promise that he gave to Abraham, you are blessed to be a blessing is upon us. We know that, but what does it actually mean to be blessed? Being blessed is about being empowered and equipped to do all that God has called us to do. No lack, no fault, no faltering, no want when it comes to stepping forward into what God has entrusted us with. That is what it means to be blessed. To have everything you need to move forward into the things of God. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. So that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. Just as Nehemiah was blessed in the story to do all that God had called him to do, so too does God want you blessed so that you can do everything God has called you to do. Equipped and empowered to move forward in the things of God. And just as Nehemiah was blessed to do that, so too does God want his church, the local body, the local church, blessed, empowered and equipped to do all that he has called it to do. That is what it is to be blessed. This is not just about finances. It includes finances, but it's not just about finances. It's about always having all sufficiency in everything. Everything, every area, whatever it is the need, God meeting and providing. Do you know, this idea of God wanting us blessed, it's always been his desire. Right back in the beginning, day one, God spoke blessing to mankind. Genesis 1, 27 to 30, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. <coughs> Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you, and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth which has life. I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. 
Picture this. God formed man from the clay. And out of his side formed woman. And he breathed life into him. And mankind for the first time stepped up on his own two feet. Rose to life. And the very first thing to hit mankind's ears was the blessing of God. God wants you blessed. Before condemnation, before guilt, before judgment, before any of these things, it was blessing. That is what God spoke to man. And he said to man, I have a great purpose for you. And I've given you everything you need to fulfill it. The first words from God to man. Blessing. Empowered and equipped to do all that God has called you to do. Do you know God is a giver? You cannot outgive God. God gives because he loves. Victor Hugo once said, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. You cannot love without giving. God gives because he loves. God is a giver, and he always gives with great intention and great purpose. When God gave us his son, Jesus, it was with great intention and great purpose. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. He gave his son, Jesus, to redeem mankind from the curse of sin and death and to restore him into a living relationship with the father. That is why he gave with great intention and great purpose to restore us into a great relationship with God the Father. When Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit, he gave the Holy Spirit with great intention and great purpose. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. You shall be my witnesses. God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. It's what his word tells us. He has already, through his son Jesus, equipped us and empowered us to do all that he has called us to do. And you know, God has some great things lined up for us to do. God has some, God has some great tasks lined up for you to do. He's got a fantastic purpose, a great calling for you. He wants to see you accomplish incredible things. Don't write yourself off from his plan. Regardless, if others have written you off, God will never write you off. He writes you in to his story. God writes you in. There's a great chapter in Nehemiah. It's chapter three. It's, it's a familiar sight in the Old Testament. It's a chapter that we probably skip past because it's a list of names. You know the chapters I'm talking about? It's one of these chapters, big list of names. And it's a list of all of those who served in the rebuilding of the walls. God sees your serving, by the way. He takes note of it. What you give, he sees. When you give of yourself, your time, your energy, your resource, he sees it. He takes note. And this, this list in chapter 3 is quite matter of fact. You know, it's so-and-so built this part of the wall and so-and-so built that part of the wall and so-and-so did this and so-and-so did that. But there's a verse in the middle of this chapter, verse 20, which stands out from the rest. I'll read it to you. It stands out because of one word. Nehemiah 3, verse 20. After him... Baruch, the son of Zebai, zealously, say zealously, yes. repaired another section from the angle to the doorway of the house of Eliashib, the high priest. The list that goes through in this chapter is very matter of fact. It's listing off the things that people did. But then it comes to this guy called Baruch, and it mentions of him that the work which he was doing, he was doing with a bit of passion. 
He was doing it zealously. It doesn't talk about that with anybody else's work, but it says of him, he did it with some extra energy. He did it excited. He did it zealously. Why does it mention that of this man here, Barak? Why was he working so zealously that it was mentioned in this list? Do you want to know why? Because Baruch was never meant to be there. He had been disqualified by the people. See, you can go into the book of Ezra, and one of the things that Ezra did and to try and restore order and try and restore the things of God was that he said, if you remember at the start, I said that some of them had drifted from the things of God and they married foreign women. Well, the, the instruction went out to these men to put away their foreign wives and their illegitimate children. They were no longer to be part of what God was doing. They were disqualified. And you know, Barak, he was one of these illegitimate children. You can find him right there in Ezra. He was not meant to be there. He wasn't meant to be involved. He'd been disqualified, written off. He didn't meet the standard. And yet here we find him actively engaged and involved in building the things of God and doing it with such great heart. And you know the amazing thing? I love it when the word of God does this. There was another person beside Baruch. His name was Ezer. Ezer translates into helper. And beside Baruch was Ezer the helper and Eliashib the high priest. See, when you get alongside Christ, our great high priest, and alongside the Holy Spirit, our great helper, you get fired up for the things of God. You get fired up building the things of God. It doesn't matter if others have written you off, God writes you back in. And he sees your passion, he sees your zeal, he takes note of it. And do you know the beautiful thing? Do you know what Barak's name means? It means blessed. It means empowered and equipped to do the things of God. Arise and build. No matter what others have said, God never writes you off. God has great things in store for you. And he wants you to bear much fruit. It's the fruit that you bear that brings him the glory. Do you know, the devil is attracted to fruit. We see it right back in the beginning, don't we? Where was the devil in the Garden of Eden? He was in the flipping fruit tree. That's where he was. The devil is attracted to fruit. He's a thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He doesn't care about you, but he cares about the fruit of your labor. He is hell-bent on making every believer and saint ineffective and ill-equipped. That's what his determination is. That's what his will is. To knock you out of the race. To make you ineffective and fruitless. And you know, we see his tactics in the story of Nehemiah. Sambalat and Tobiah were determined to discredit, discourage, and distract Nehemiah. I mean, they were utterly determined. At every turn, they wanted to wipe him out. And it's interesting, as you go through the story, as the, the, the closer the people got to rebuilding these walls, the greater the threat intensified. It starts off with just Sam Ballot and Tobiah, and then Geshem turns up on the scene, and then moments later, they've gathered a crowd, and then a little while later, they've gathered an army. See, at every new level, there is a new devil. <laughs> but greater is he that is in us. Greater is he that is in us. Nehemiah was not going to be distracted, discouraged, or dismayed. He was staying on course to make sure he finished what he had started. He was sticking it out. And you know, the answer to accomplishing what God has called us to do, despite the opposition, is found in Nehemiah 4.17. It says, those who were rebuilding the wall and those who carried burdens took their load with one hand doing the work and the other hand holding a weapon. They had tools in one hand which they worked with, but they also were armed. 
We need to put on the full armor of God. And every day as we build, carry the word, the sword of God with us as well. Just as we build. Do you know the people in the story had opportunity to stop short? The threat became quite serious. Some people have stopped short of where God wants them to be. And they pray and ask God for strength to endure the persecution rather than asking God for the strength to finish what they started. But we're not meant to endure a persecution. We are meant to complete that which God has told us to do. And when we complete the task at hand, I want to encourage you, the enemy loses all confidence. Nehemiah 6, it says, So the wall was completed on the 25th of the month Elul in 52 days. When all our enemies heard of it, and all the nations surrounding us saw it, they lost their confidence. For they recognized that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Church, this is not a moment to pray for strength to endure. This is a moment to pray for strength to finish that which God has called us to do. We need to push through. Push through. That's what Make It In March is all about. Going for it with everything we have. How do we push through? We arm ourselves with the word of God while we build. The devil wants to steal, kill, and destroy the fruit of your labor. But God has given us great promises to build with. Malachi 3 verse 10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows, then I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts, and all the nations will call you blessed for you shall be a delightful land. God promises to rebuke the devourer as we play our part, bringing in our tithes and giving over and above. And in the story of Nehemiah, the king granted Nehemiah great resources to get started in what it was he wanted to do. But then there came a moment for the people to step up. They not only served, but they gave as well. They sowed into the work. You can find that in Nehemiah chapter 7. See, the people gave as one. They worked as one and they finished as one. There is great power in one. There is great power when people come together. Church, next week is our opportunity to step up, to rise up, and to sow into the great work as we make it in March. That is what next week is all about. That is what this moment is all about, sowing into the work together as one. We sow by bringing in our tithes and giving over and above in our offerings. What is a tithe? A tithe is the faith-filled act and declaration that we trust God. That's what a tithe is. I trust you, God. I recognize you as the Lord of all and the source of everything that I have, and I trust you. A tithe is the first tenth, the first ten percent of all our increase. Before we give to anything or anyone else, we bring it back to God because it's his anyway. By bringing it into the local storehouse. And our offerings, our offerings is our heartfelt thanks and the action of our appreciation and gratitude, which we give over and above our tithes with cheerfulness and genuine generosity. That is what we sow. Why do we sow, though? Why do we sow? Why do we bring in our tithes? Why do we give over and above? Well, the first reason, it's biblical. There doesn't need to be another reason after that, but it's biblical. 
Bringing in our tithes and giving offerings isn't man's idea. It's God's. He wants us actively involved. We find it before the law and the life of Abraham. We find it in the law. We find it in the minor prophets as we're read in Malachi. And we find it endorsed by Jesus himself. There was opportunity for Jesus to finish the act of tithing, but instead he endorsed it. And unlike some other areas of the law, it is not fulfilled or finished in Christ. It continues on to this day. Tithing and giving is biblical. It is never finished. The second reason why we sow is because it resources the house. It resources the house. Just as God gives with great intention and great purpose, so should we. God instructs that the whole tithe and the whole offering be brought into the local storehouse so that there may be food, provision in his house. He wants us to be actively involved in his kingdom's advance. And church, we do not give to get, we give to give. That is why we give. God wants you blessed, empowered and equipped to do everything he's called you to do because he wants his house, the church, blessed so that it can be empowered and equipped to do everything God has called it to do. God's got a great purpose for us here in Glasgow. Make it in March is our moment to step up and commit to his house being empowered and equipped. The third reason why we sow is that it results in increase. It results in increase. God's kingdom works through exchange. When you sow, you will reap. 2 Corinthians 9, it tells us that when you sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly. But when you sow generously, we reap generously. I want you to just think for a second about a fruit, say an orange. Anyone like fruit? Anyone think they need to eat more fruit? (laughs) Yep, I fall into that camp. When you think about a fruit, an orange, there's only one part which has the potential for increase. There's only one part of that fruit which has the potential for increase. That is the seed. The seed is the only part. And many, when they're eating fruit, if you're like me, might accidentally eat the seed or just throw it away, discard it, passes by or is consumed unnoticed. Do you know, one of the fruits of our labor is the income that we generate through the works of our hands. The devil is set out to destroy it. We've already said he's attracted to fruit. He wants to devour it. One of the fruits of our labor is our income. What are you doing with the seed? Are you throwing it away? Are you consuming it without it even being noticed? What are you doing with the seed? We should sow it. It's the only part that has a potential for increase. And you know, God truly is amazing. He's not a respecter of persons. If his promise is true for one, it is true for all. If his promises apply to you, they apply to the person next to you and vice versa. If you were to compare two oranges, a big one and a small one, just like this up on the screen, and these were to represent your income, and I was to ask you the question, which one of these has the greatest potential for increase? What's the answer? Neither. They both hold seed. And when they are sown with faith into good soil, they will reap a harvest. When we sow, we reap. Every one of us has a part to play. Every one of us. Don't write yourself off. The increase that we receive from our sowing has two purposes. Firstly, food for our enjoyment. And secondly, further seed for further sowing. We are called to be blessed to be a blessing. We're called to be blessed to be a blessing. 
You know, when we sow, when we bring back our tithes and give over and above, we are answering a question. Do we trust God? I personally love tithing. I love it. I love it when I tithe. And I have the opportunity each month to do so. I genuinely love it. I love it when I tithe and I love it when I give. Why? Because it's a moment where I get to declare over every single area of my life that God is my source and I trust him. That regardless of what comes against me, regardless of what need or want or lack is trying to present itself, regardless of the situations, when I tithe and when I give, it's a moment where I say, God, you are my source, you are in control, and I trust you. I love it. That is what it's all about. But you know, not only that, when we give, and especially when we give as one, not only, we, not only are we answering the question, do we trust God? But we're also answering the question that God is asking, can I trust you? Luke 16, 10, he who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, who will entrust the true riches to you? Church, today, God is asking a question of us. Can I trust you? Can I trust you with the people in this city? Can I trust you with this nation? Can I trust you with those whose hearts are crying out for a savior? Can I trust you with those who need to be built up in the word and in a life of faith? Can I trust you? God is asking that of us today. What is our answer going to be? What is our answer going to be? This is not an area to be lukewarm in, but it requires our red hot commitment. This is the day of God's power. This is the day for us to be bold, to be blessed, to be determined, and to be one. So church, in this day, I encourage you, let us arise as one and build. God has great works in store for us. Let's accomplish everything that we have set out to do by his blessing, by his grace, by his love, and by his life. God is with us and God is for us and he is with you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Come on, let's just give God some praise.